Hello there, I'm Professor Seth Fry, and welcome to Module 7, where we're going to learn about something in Python called a dictionary, uh, and something called a nested dictionary, when you put more dictionaries inside other dictionaries. So, um, a dictionary is a type of collection, you've encountered collections before, you've encountered lists. Now, um, uh, lists and dictionaries are fundamentally different types of collections. In the same way that a stack of plates is different than a uh, than a, than, a, than a bag of treats. So it wouldn't make sense to store a bunch of plates in a bag where they're all jumbled together. Plates stack nicely. It makes a lot of sense to kind of order them top to bottom. Conversely, a bag of candy, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to, to, to collect a bunch of candy into a stack. Uh, candy's not made to stack. It's made for holding in bags. So different things are handy to collect in different ways. And uh, yeah, I know that sounds like a metaphor, but that's a surprisingly um, uh, comprehensive description of the difference between uh, these different types of collections, lists and dictionaries. So you're going to learn this new type of collection, dictionary, how to build them, access them, change them, the same way uh, that you've learned uh, how to uh, build, access, and change lists. Uh, you're going to um, learn, you know, kind of what they bring. Uh, learn what they bring when you uh, pack them inside of each other, when you build nested dictionaries. You can nest lists inside of dictionaries, dictionaries inside of lists. And by putting collections of collections of collections, you can represent increasingly complex ideas and, and um, more faithfully represent things in the world and all their complexity. Uh, we're going to learn to loop through a dictionary the way we've looped through lists. Uh, and uh, as we um, build more complex objects, we're going to actually make that connection to things in the real world and show how it is that, uh, that these sort of introductory concepts in, in, in Python so surprisingly accurately um, represent real world things. Uh, so after running your boilerplate code, um, we'll start with our introduction to dictionaries. So, knowing lists actually gives us a great foundation for understanding dictionaries. Uh, lists are going to be ordered collections because that index uh, is their address, you know, based on their order in the collection. Uh, dictionaries are named collections, so they're stored in terms of their name. How are we going to pin that down? What does that mean? We're about to see. It's actually pretty concrete. Um, uh, but in, in, in a lot of ways, everything you've learned to do with lists is something we're going to learn to do with dictionaries. So you're already uh, pretty far along, and you're going to find the syntax is pretty comparable, too. For example, um, uh, we have here uh, defining a dictionary. So where we define a list with square brackets, we define an empty list in, with empty square brackets. Here we're defining an empty dictionary with empty curly brackets. It's just a different syntax. And this is one of the things you kind of memorize. Uh, curly brackets means dictionary. So when we run that, and when we get the type of this object, we'll get dict, just like str is short for string, as the type of a string object in Python, dict is uh, short for dictionary. That's the, the, the type of thing that a dictionary is in Python. Um, now we can see what initialization looks like. Uh, this is going to look a lot like the way we did with lists. There's no curly brackets. We're back to square brackets when we're indexing. So when we index a list, we have the name of the list. We've got square brackets, and we have the address. Before that address was a number, signifying the order, uh, the address of the thing in the list uh, as its order in the list. Here, we're going by a name. Like I said, uh, named collections, pretty literally, we put the name in the square brackets, and that's how we get the thing back, or that's how we assign to it. Uh, and already, you know, this is pretty simple. Like, uh, um, these aren't super deep concepts. We have square brackets, and instead of putting numbers in them, now we're putting uh, strings in them. Um, and we assign things to that. But already, we can sort of um, start to do stuff that's meaningful, start to represent information. In this case, what we have is a mapping of people to their favorite uh, flavor of ice cream. We run that, and now we can start to query this dictionary. And again, we'll query it in the same way we were querying lists. But instead of putting a number in the square bracket, we'll put a string in the square bracket. When we run it, um, we'll pull the value back from Bob, and we get strawberry, because strawberry is uh, Bob's favorite flavor of ice cream. Um, just like a list has a, a length, a dictionary has a length. It's not. You might have thought maybe it would be eight, 
because there's these four names and there's these four strings here and these four strings there for a total of eight. No, there's a, there's a total of four, what we're gonna call key value pairs. This is jargon. Um, the index, the thing that goes in here, that's gonna be called the key. And when you put a key into a dictionary, that's what we're doing here, we're gonna get the value back. The value is the output, the thing being stored. The key is the index, it's the name uh, in named collection. So um, uh, we can, this is like an alternate syntax for authoring dictionaries. Um, instead of, but when we built a list, we would have like a thing, then a comma, a thing, then a comma, a thing, then a comma. Uh, so a list was a, a, a bunch of stuff. A dictionary is a bunch of pairs of stuff. Um, key value pairs specifically. So instead of uh, comma, 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 we're going to see colon, comma, colon, comma, colon, comma, and in curly brackets rather than square brackets. So the thing before the colon is going to be the key, the thing after the colon is going to be the value. Key, value, key, value. What do we have here? Our previous dictionary mapped people to their um, favorite flavor of ice cream. This one maps people to their grade in a class. And when we run it, what we should get as output is Jill's grade, which looked like an A plus. Good for her. Uh, we can represent the populations of cities. So um, key, value, key, value. And when we index it, well, we're gonna get the value mapped to Chicago, which is uh, about 2.7 million. Great. So um, we've uh, defined a bunch of uh, dictionaries. Uh, we've showed how to access them. We've showed the kinds of things you can do with them. And that's a good place for you to start and uh, try it out. Continuing along, we're gonna continue to see that what we learned about lists continues to map pretty nicely to dictionaries. So um, we had this in keyword, and just like in, let us look for things in the dictionary, uh, in a list. Uh, the contents of the of the list collection in also lets us look into dictionaries. There are some subtleties, and that's why we have to relearn it. Um, uh, when we use in, we can only look in the keys. We can't look in the values. Uh, so Alice is in your dict because Alice was one of the keys. Um, Eve was not one of the keys, and chocolate was one of the values. It wasn't one of the keys. So chocolate here down here returns false. Um, now. Uh, we're going to pay attention to Eve here. So we never defined, if we go back up to our, our um, uh, definition of your dict, what we're going to find is we never defined a value for Eve, and that's why it returned false here. Uh, uh, now it's worth, so before when we were working with lists, if we put in a, num if we put in a, a number that was never assigned, if we put in an address and no one lives there, um, if I have a list of four things and I try to index 10, I'll get an error. And it's the same thing with dictionary. Because we've never defined a value for Eve, um, if I try to index Eve, um, I'm going to get this error right here. That's a, that's a big reason that in exists. So we can sort of look for things in a dictionary. If we're not sure they're there, we can look for them before causing an error. Uh, and um, this has enough to it that I'm going to give you an opportunity to practice this and try out um, checking for things in dictionaries before we move along. So with all these similarities of dictionaries to lists, you might be asking, well, why do I have to learn this other concept? What is this really buying me? Um, couldn't I just pretend that my just use dictionaries all the time and sort of pretend that my, my, my lists are dictionaries? You sort of can. So here's a list definition, um, A, B, C, and when we index item one, we're going to get B back. I can actually kind of create the same data structure in a dictionary. Um, my key value pairs are going to be number, value, number, value, number, value. I'm using curly brackets instead of square brackets because it's a dictionary. Uh, and when I index one, I should get B back the same way I got B back here. Okay, so um, what are dictionaries really buying you if they're kind of sort of the same in this way, if, if dictionaries can mimic being a list? Um, the answer, uh, um, 
The easy answer is dictionaries are kind of more flexible, um, and that flexibility comes at the cost. Yeah, we're at such an intro level of Python that we're not talking about performance. I'm not teaching you how to write code that runs fast, but once that becomes something that matters to you, which could be years from now, honestly, um, then you'll really start to care about the difference between lists and dictionaries. But the, the bigger takeaway here is that um, if you're not totally, if you're facing some real world situation and you don't know, oh, is this inherently ordered or is this inherently named? Like, what's the right underlying kind of representation of this real world thing? Uh, if you're not sure, um, maybe, uh, and you might ask yourself, oh, is that a problem with Python that's not like sufficiently distinguishing these types of collections? Is it a problem with, uh, with Seth, with Professor Fry, with me, that I didn't adequately explain the difference? Uh, as likely as not, um, it's just that um, there's ambiguities in the world and there's real choices that any person gets to make about the best way to represent complex things in the real world. You'll make choices. And so each of those could be valid, kind of depending what you're trying to do. Um, and so by, by tackling these subtleties, we can kind of get at that tension between the real world and our models of it, which, um, which is what uh, um, social science with online data is all about. Uh, there's enough here to kind of play with and, uh, and, and try a couple things out before we move along. So where um, uh, collections really become powerful as representations of the real world is when you start to put them in each other. So when we were first introduced to lists, I showed you, you can put strings in there, you can put numbers in there, you can put booleans in there. I, don't, I didn't actually show you this, but you can also put lists in a list. And the th you know, if you put a list in a list, if you put a list in a list at address three, if you index that list, um, at you know uh, at three, what you'll get back is a list that you can then index again. Um, why would you want to do this? Well, before we had our mapping of cities to their populations, but what if I wanted to create a, a mapping of cities to their neighborhoods? Their uh, cities have more than one neighborhood, and a list might be a great representation of that. So what we have here um, is the key is New York, and the value is the list of the five boroughs. The next key is Chicago, and then the list is a long list of neighborhoods. We're doing the same for Los Angeles, and then way back at the end we've got Bug Tussle. Bug Tussle, Kentucky doesn't really have a, isn't too big. Um, and I think it's just got like 100 or so people, so it doesn't have any neighborhoods, so it's represented by an empty list. When we run this, what we'll get back are gonna be all the, we're gonna index this dictionary, and we'll get lists back. See, the five boroughs. Now if I wanted to, to know what's the, what's the first borough in this list, I'm representing the boroughs kind of like they're ordered, but we'll, we're not gonna worry there. If I just index, add an index to the end of this, what I'm gonna get back, this whole Bronx thing is gonna turn, uh, this whole list is gonna turn just into the first item in that list, Bronx. When I get rid of it, I'm gonna get the list back. Why is that? Because my first index gave me a list and the return value of that, I then put another pair of square brackets in to query that list inside, or that collection inside of a collection. Uh, we can, uh, now if that's hard to think through, kind of, if it's a lot to think about, we can kind of do it in two steps if you want. We'll, put, we'll take New York, and then we'll get a list back, and we'll assign that to a, val a, a variable, New York neighborhoods, and then New York neighborhoods, we can index just like a list and get um, the thing at address two is Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan. When I run this, we should get Manhattan back. There we are. Um, uh, so this is just a shortcut for that, and it's maybe it's less readable, maybe it's uh, equally readable. As you get used to it, you get pretty comfortable seeing all these uh, square brackets next to each other. Uh, that's enough to play around with, less inside a list. So um, uh, do your best, and we'll uh, we'll continue along. So uh, inside collections and collections, now we've got dictionaries and dictionaries. Um, so we went from mapping cities to their populations. Uh, then we went from cities to their neighborhoods. Now I want to do um, cities uh, to their neighborhoods to their populations. I want to, instead of representing just the city's big aggregate population, I want to know the population of, uh, of the city in terms of its boroughs. I want to be able to, uh, or in terms of its neighborhoods, I want to be able to sum up all the parts of a city and get the population back, for example. Um, so here's what we're doing now. We've got a key, New York, and its value is this 
dictionary mapping the neighborhoods of their populations. The second key at the high level here um, is another dictionary mapping all the neighborhoods of Chicago um, to their populations. Now you're going to notice like this is kind of becoming hard to keep track of. Where am I closing? Is this a closing bracket of a dictionary or of a dictionary in a dictionary or of a dictionary in a dictionary in a dictionary? Maybe is there a list in dictionary and dictionary? This can get really hard to keep track of and that's a problem we're going to get to. But I've explained to you the structure of this data object. We've got a dictionary. Each, uh, each value of each key is another dictionary. That inner dictionary maps the neighborhoods of some city to their population. And we can treat this just like we've been treating it. Uh, when I run this code, this first line there, uh, by throwing New York in as the key, the value I'm going to get back is a dictionary. Um, uh, within that dictionary, it's got key value pairs. One of the keys is Manhattan. What I should get back is the value associated with Manhattan in the dictionary in New York. What's the value of Manhattan? It's uh, right here, let's see, 1.6 million. So I should get, as the first value, uh, 1.6 million back. Uh, second, I pull out the Chicago Dictionary and I look for the number of people in the central neighborhood in Chicago. Third, I do LA and get the cent central LA. Let's look at those, uh, let's look manually kind of um, as our sanity check before running this code. Uh, do, 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 Chicago Central, I should get about a quarter million. And then for my last line of the three outputs, I should get about 800 million. So let's run it. I should get uh, 1.6 million, quarter million, 800 million as the outputs of this code. And there it is, just like you'd expect. That's good news. Uh, so by, we can we can sort of uh, tag these by being able to tag these indices on top of each other, tag these pairs of square brackets on top of each other. We can dive in very efficiently to a complex object with lots of parts. Uh, it ends up being pretty concise and clean, and you you become more familiar with it. Uh, there's enough here to play around with, um, so try it out, and uh, we'll continue along. So we can really take this mat and this nesting of objects inside of objects inside of objects uh, as as far as we want to go. Um, our our recent uh, um, complex idea we we captured is uh, putting uh, representing the population of a city in terms of the population of all of its neighborhoods. We created a very kind of unreadable long object that was really hard to understand. We're just going to create that same object, but while typing everything out, we're just going to hit enter. Oh, we're going to create new lines. So this looks like code. This looks like lots of lines of code, but really this is one thing. We're allowed to actually use indenting and use new lines in the middle of the definition of an object. So uh, I could put all of this on one line. And like, boy, imagine all of that whole thing on one line. That wouldn't be very readable. So Python, for the sake of readability, it's a very readable language, lets you just sort of arbitrarily put spaces. Is, is this object fundamentally different from, you know, uh, this object? You know, if there's no indents? No, it's not fundamentally different. They're the same thing. The spaces mean nothing. It's sort of more uh, readable. If you uh, if you indent to sort of represent the idea that Central is in Chicago, therefore Central is more nested more uh, nested more deeply than Chicago. Uh, but uh, these things are for you; they're not for the computer. When we put spaces, when we put new lines, uh, if we run this. Um, populations by neighborhood two, the same sets of indices that got us results on populations by neighborhood should get us the same values on populations by neighborhood two. But we get closer to the readability, which turns out to be more and more valuable. I'll give you tools for that. Um, I, so we could have, we defined it that way. We defined it with this great indenting, super readable, very nice. But when I take populations by neighborhood two, I could index it the same way as before. But when I print it out, I, this, I didn't get that beautiful structure back. It didn't really respect all the work I did hitting tab and enter a bunch of times until it looked nice. It looks awful. Um, Python provides uh, a little utility, we'll say, of printing dictionaries out in a way that's pretty. It's actually called pretty printing. 
Um, so you import pprint. pprint is a Python module. It only has one function. That function has the same name, pprint, short for pretty print. So module dot function, if we pretty print populations by neighborhood, we'll get like a nicely indented representation of this object. And that's nice um, because we're building more and more complex things. Uh, so we want to be able to maintain our sanity, which means being able to do sanity checks, which means being able to look at the data and make sure it looks like we expect. Now, uh, when I look at this, it's really hard to tell if it looks like I expect because I have to do a lot of decoding. But here, this is a lot easier to say, oh yeah, that looks like I expect. It would pop out to me if it said Chicago in there. That wouldn't line up nicely. That's wrong. Chicago is not a neighborhood of Los Angeles. It's a different city. Uh, to find out if Chicago is accidentally ending up somewhere in L.A. here as a neighborhood, I, I don't know. Let's see, far southwest. I don't even know what that's a key to. I kind of have to work backwards. Oh, it's a part of Chicago. Okay. So pretty printing helps us evaluate. Continuing all the parallels of lists uh, to dictionaries, uh, these different types of collections, you can also loop through a dictionary, again, with, with slight tweaks on the way we used to loop through a list. So... Um, dictionaries are key value pairs. So my placeholder variable used to be when I was looping through a list, I would just get one thing at a time. When I loop through a dictionary, I sort of get two things at a time. Every iteration I get both a key and a value because sometimes I want to work with both. So our syntax isn't so different. Here's our dictionary definition. We've got uh, Tommy uh, is age 32, Zula is age 9, and Joanna is age 18. Uh, and here's going to be our for loop for key comma value. So placeholder one, um, this could also be called name, right? Name, um, age, if I wanted to do that. And I would type, instead of key, I'd replace key with name, I'd replace age. I just wrote key value to show you what's involved. Key comma value in ages is my name of my dictionary. I have to do this uh, dot items. That's just a function I have to call when I loop through dictionaries. It's just one of those things you have to memorize. Uh, but with that in place, name.age, and every time I loop through, my first uh, iteration through um, this dictionary uh, is going to give me uh, the pair Tommy and 32. Uh, and I'm actually going to print out Tommy is 32 years old. My second iteration is going to give me the pair Zula and 9. My third is going to give me the pair Joanna and 18. When I run this, I should get the ages of those three in sentences, in sentence form. Something's going on. Um, we're going to fix that up. And there, it works just fine. Zula is 9 years old. Tommy is 32 years old. Joanna is 18 years old. Great. So we're now able to iterate through a dictionary, which means, which has all the usefulness that iterating through lists had. We can uh, do more and more complex stuff when we can examine every uh, all the contents of a dictionary kind of one by one. Um, uh, so for another application of this, another sort of use of this, going back to our populations example, uh, let's say I wanted to know the sums of all the populations of all these cities. Um, I could build a counter the same way we built a counter when we had a list. So I'm going to take the total, I'm going to initialize it to zero, then for every pair of things in city populations, I'm going to add the population. So for city comma population in populations, I'm going to take total pop and I'm going to add to it um, population, uh, the, the population in that pair. So I'm going to start off with zero, then zero is going to become um, 8 million, 8.6 million. Then uh, total pop is going to become eight, whatever 8.6 million plus 2.7 million is, and on and on and on until I have the, uh, the sum of all of these. Uh, it turns out between New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Bug Tussle, we, uh, we've got 15 million people. That's quite a bit. This is an illustration of the usefulness of looping through dictionaries. There's other things you can do looping through dictionaries. So uh, let's say that um, every class I sort of um, can tell who did their work uh, and I keep a list of all the people who didn't, who weren't involved. Or if I'm teaching a physical class, I keep a list of all the people who didn't show up. So um, over over four lectures, um, Greta didn't show up, Gregory didn't show up, Pretz and Pollyanna didn't show up. Pollyanna didn't show up another time. Myung didn't show up. Then Pretz missed a couple more, and then Gregory missed another. 
Uh, so this is my list of absences over time. I'm not keeping great records. I'm just sort of writing down a name. But given this list, I sort of want to know um, by individual, how many absences did each individual have? Uh, so we're going to um, uh, actually, from this list, we're going to convert it into a dictionary. Um, uh, what I'm going to want is a dictionary where the key is the name of the student and the value is their number of absences. So that's the, what I want. What I'm going to start with is an empty dictionary and we're going to populate it over time. So uh, for name and absences, that's absences right here. So uh, the first value of, for, of name in for name and absences is going to be Greta. The second is going to be Gregory. The third is going to be Pratt's. Fourth is going to be Pollyanna. Fifth is going to be Pollyanna and so on. Um, for name and absences, take absences count, take the name I just got, and then make it equal to zero. And we're just going to print that out. So this is not accomplishing what I said we wanted to accomplish. We're not getting from that a list of all the absences. We're getting um, zeros for everybody. How is this helping us? This is helping us, this is called initialization. We're initializing an empty dictionary. And that's useful in the same way that it's useful here to have absences count equals an empty dictionary. It's the same way that it's useful here to have total pop equals zero. You kind of have to start somewhere. You start off with nothing and then from nothing you build up. So we're going to take absences count, which is now initialized. It has all the names of all the students and zeros. And what we get to do is run through it. We're good. We already went through absences once. Now we're going to run through absences again. Um, for every name and absences, query that name and whatever the value is, they're all zero right now, add one to that. Eventually when we hit, um, uh, so uh, a couple people were in there several times. Pretz was in there three times, Grigory was in there twice, Pollyanna was in there twice. So when Pollyanna's name comes up the first time, this get, her value gets incremented from zero to one. When she comes up a second time, her value, this line runs and her value gets incremented from one to two. So that's another application of iterating through dictionaries, is we can build a fine-grained counter. You know, we, for the city populations example, we started off with the whole population of the whole city, and then our second example kind of broke it down by neighborhood. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We, we sort of got raw data on just all the people who are absent, and from that we were able to build another representation of the data that illustrates absences by person. So for a third application, we can sort of organize sports statistics. So uh, what we have here is a data structure representing um, some classic uh, NBA uh, players and their statistics. We've got the age, the, the number, um, field goal percentage, three-point percentage, and points per game uh, for, four, uh, for four of the best bowls in 1996. And um, this is like a nested dictionary. It's like, you can almost see it like a tree structure. It's like this nested structure. But nested structures are not the kind of structures that we normally interact with when we do statistics. Let's say you're really into sports analytics and you really want to analyze this data. What you're going to want is like Excel format, like a grid. A grid is a fundamentally different type of collection. It's another type of data representation that's different from the data representation of nested dictionaries or lists. So what we're going to want to do is take this nested dictionary format and convert it to the tabular format that, you'll, uh, that you use all the time if you do statistics or analytics. So we'll run this um, and then um, we're going to ask what are, I just want to extract let's say the ages of all these players. So um, I'm going to create an a empty list I'm going to iterate through the dictionary object in, with the key value pairs. I'm just going to add, uh, append all the ages. So if I wanted to, uh, so the ages of all those players are 30, 32, 34, and 27. I took that complex data structure and I distilled it down to one facet I was interested in. Now if I want to build a table, uh, we'll again do our for loop with our key value pairs, name, comma, stats. Uh, and I'm going to use this format. So you've experienced this before. This is a string with these little placeholder curly brackets. These curly brackets are different than the dictionary curly brackets. You just sort of have to remember that. Uh, then we've got format. And format takes a lot of arguments. And these are each argument maps to a pair of curly brackets. So name is going to go 
in the first position, then there's going to be comma, then it will get age, then comma, then, sure, uh, then uh, number, then comma, and on and on and on and on. When I run this, what I should get is a table. This is the kind of data that uh, isn't so far from being able to copy and paste in the, to Google, uh, Google Sheets or, or Microsoft Excel or whatever. This is tabular data. All the columns have one type of data. Um, and we're able to convert from nested dictionary kind of tree-like format to the tabular format that's more familiar. So this is yet another uh, use of looping through um, collections uh, or, or collections of collections. Uh, there's enough here to play around with, so, so give this a try and we'll continue along. So having done more and more uh, with uh, dictionaries and nested dictionaries, uh, we're, we're getting uh, further and further from list territory and closer and closer to like real world things in the real world. So we can start to ask ourselves, okay, what makes a person a person? Like if we were to represent a person as a bunch of numbers, um, how would we organize those numbers to represent the person? So what we have here is like a, a statistical representation of a person. It's not the full representation of a person. It's focused on certain aspects. Maybe it's a, a medical view into that person or a historical view into that person. Uh, the, 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 the information we've aggregated is their name, information about their family, uh, information about their size, and information about their vitals. Maybe this is like a, a medical records thing. I don't know. Um, and this is a lot less regular of an object than we've dealt with before. So when we were dealing with the basketball stats, I had the same information about every player. When we were dealing with population by neighborhood, I had the same information about every neighborhood. It was, I was only interested in population. But here, every key value pair is a little different. This first key, name, has the value of a, of a one-level dictionary with pretty straightforward um, text-to-text mappings. Uh, and specific keys, right? First, middle, and surname. No other value in uh, person stats, this variable, has the keys first, middle, surname. Family, for example, has a dictionary, and that dictionary only has two keys, and one of those keys is a list. Uh, build has a dictionary uh, and a dictionary uh, in, sorry, it has a dictionary, that's this, in a dictionary in uh, a dictionary. So that's a lot of nesting. Now why do we have that? To represent increasingly complex objects. Because it makes sense uh, for weight to be one number, but height, we might want to represent that as two numbers, break, broken down by feet and inches. Uh, similarly, body temperature makes sense to represent with one number, but blood pressure makes sense to represent with two numbers, systolic, diastolic. So rather than representing it with a number, I represent it with a dictionary that in turn represents two numbers. So we can really um, kind of break the symmetry that we were dealing with before and create increasingly sort of nuanced or complex representations. Using nested dictionaries, we get closer and closer to representing information in the world. Uh, when I run this, uh, person stats, name, surname, I should get average, Joe average. Joe Happy Meal average is the full name, and I just extracted the last name. Um, if I want to just pull out systolic blood pressure, I'm going to see, okay, well, systolic's here. I want the number 120. It's uh, the value of the key systolic, which in turn is a value in the dictionary assigned to blood pressure which in turn is a value in the dictionary assigned to vitals. So if I take person stats, square brackets vitals, square brackets blood pressure, square brackets systolic, I should get 120 back. Great. Um, let's say, okay, I represented height in terms of two number feet and inches, but now I just want to know how tall that person is in inches. Um, I can represent that. I'll extract the feet. Um, I'll extract the inches. And before adding them together, I'll multiply the feet by 12. So feet times 12 plus uh, 8 inches is going to be uh, 68 inches. Joe Happy Meal Average is 68 inches tall, uh, which is actually a pretty average height. So uh, nested dictionaries, they're really everywhere. Um, if you've ever hit view source on a web page like I've made you do in this class, if you looked at HTML, HTML is sort of secretly nested dictionary. Um, 
all the every single demo we've had looking through Wikipedia, looking through Twitter, looking through Privacy Badger, I kind of insulated you from like the raw representation of the data uh, up until now. In every single case, that raw representation was dictionaries of dictionaries. So everything we've done um, uh, is represented this way. And all these scary vocabulary terms, this acronym HTML, this acronym JSON, whatever that is, right? Um, they're suddenly less scary because they're just big words for a pretty familiar idea. Dictionaries, uh, if they're simple enough, then dictionaries inside dictionaries are simple enough. You get it. Uh, there's one concept uh, that buys you a lot of jargon for free. Uh, so there's enough to work with there. Um, try this all out and we will uh, move along. So having discovered dictionaries and nested dictionaries and having seen closer and closer um, how they're used to represent, or the extent to which they're used to represent real world things, and this kind of impressive sort of complexity you can get uh, 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 using nested dictionaries to represent the real world, we can ask a, a big, we can bring it all together and ask a big deep philosophical question, what, what is a tweet? What's a tweet really? So is this a tweet? Um, most cutting thing you can say is who's this clown because it implies they're A, a clown, and B, not even, <laughs> I laugh every time, not even one of the better known clowns. Great. Is that a tweet? No, that's like, a, that's a sentence. Okay, fine. That's kind of pedantic. How about this? This image right here. Is this a tweet? Um, no, it's a picture of a tweet. It's not really a tweet. It's not what a tweet is. I'm, uh, again, kind of pedantic, but that's, uh, the point is, there's such a thing as what a tweet is, what a tweet really is. I'm going to show you. A tweet is a nested dictionary. This is a tweet. This is actually the first tweet. Um, this dictionary right here. It's got a lot of stuff in it. Did you know a tweet has this much stuff in it? Uh, a tweet has... Uh, when you look at... Here's the picture of a tweet. Let's look, what's all the information here? We've got a um, handle. We've got a sort of display name. We have this. This is part of what a tweet is, is who tweeted it. Um, we have follow, which can also say following, so that the tweet keeps track of your relationship to it. Um, it's got text. Uh, it's got a date. It's got a time. It's got a number of retweets and likes. It's got a number of people who follow it with their ident identities. These are all things in the tweet. Um, and the tweet, as a tweet, as the thing it is, has to store all that information or it's not a tweet. Uh, so we can already gain a lot of insight into Twitter just by skimming this. I don't know what all these key value pairs mean, um, but I can guess. So when I see geo, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and guess that that is um, uh, the coordinates of the tweet for people who have location turned on when they use Twitter. The, um, Jack here didn't. I don't think they would implemented that feature yet. So we don't know where Jack was when uh, the first tweet was tweeted. This says none. Um, Lang. I'm just going to go ahead and guess that that's the language the tweet's in. Uh, Twitter keeps track of the language of every tweet. Um, and it's saying that this one was in English. Um, and then here's the text. Just setting up my Twitter. That's the first tweet. Uh, so the text, obviously, is part of the tweet. It's a surprisingly small part of the tweet. We think of what a tweet is as mostly the text. But if you look at this full view of what a tweet is, the text is a very small part of it. And even more surprising, the biggest part of what a tweet is seems to be the person who tweeted it. Look, look how much of... This is all a nested dictionary, right? We've got within the tweet the user, within the user, all these properties of the user. These aren't properties of the tweet. All this stuff about the user is essential to what the tweet is. And it's taking up more, most of my screen, right? It's taking up more than the screen's height. Whereas all the stuff about the tweet itself is only taking up half of my screen. So, so you ever wonder, like, what do we mean when we say social media? Literally, most of the media is social information, is information not about the tweet itself, but about the person who's, who sent it. Even more uh, uh, literal than that, no, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. So a tweet being a nested dictionary is something we can play around with in code. 
so I can query all this information about it. There's both the, uh, the user's name and there's their screen name. The screen name is at Jack. The name, the display name, is Jack with these little worldy uh, emoji. Um, we've got the creation date. Uh, we've got the text. Obviously, I extracted the te text from the tweet. Uh, this uh, created at, this date, is a lot more complex. This is accurate down to the second. So when I look at, like, the tweet, I see, like, it was 12.50 p.m. I don't see how many seconds had passed, but actually in the tweet itself uh, is a representation of precisely what second it was sent. Now, that's not useful to you, but it's super useful on the back end because uh, if Twitter wants to organize my tweets in the order I tweeted them, it's got to keep track of, of precisely when they were sent. So that's part of what a tweet is. It's really um, a lot more accurate than we think about certain things. Um, so here's additional information. Uh, we can extract whether the user is verified. True. Jack is one of these fancy verified users, not like us plebeian normal users. Um, we've got the ID of the tweet and the ID of the user. So um, Twitter records tweets sequentially, actually. So the, the fact that this uh, tweet is ID 20 means that even though it's the first tweet in history, it's actually sort of on the back end. It was probably the 20th tweet. There were probably 19 tweets before it. They just didn't, they were never public. Similarly, we think of, uh, so uh, Jack, this is, uh, this is Jack Dorsey. He's the boss of Twitter, one of the founders. But he actually wasn't the first person uh, or even the second person to create an account. Kind of looks like he might have been the 12th person or uh, a, a, as late as the 12th person. Uh, so then uh, this idea that most of the tweet is the person who sent it, uh, let's quantify that. Let's say precisely how much of the tweet or what proportion of the tweet isn't the content of the tweet, but the content, uh, but information about the person who sent it. So we're going to take the length of the overall first tweet. This is the number of keys in the tweet. Then we're going to take um, the length of the, nest, the dictionary nested inside the user. Um, what are we going to get? We're going to get that there's... 23 key value pairs in the tweet. One of those key value pairs is a user mapped on to all the information about the user, which is this other dictionary that has 44 key value pairs. So it's almost two to one that for every information about the every bit of information about the tweet, there's two pieces of information about the person who sent it. So that's really uh, the social part of social media. We can even go more social. Um, our truly social medium uh, would be one where the medium what it is depends not just on who sent it, but on who's looking at it. So is that, is that the case of a tweet, that what it is, um, the form it takes depends on who's looking at it? If you look at the tweet, there's a couple entries here um, that aren't about the tweet. They're about your relationship to it. So um, our, this following key, this following false, this is a question about me, my account. Is my account following uh, this user? So uh, part of what the tweet is is what is my relationship to the person who sent it. What we have here, retweeted. Uh, this is, did I retweet that tweet? So the information uh, presented uh, about the tweet uh, is information not just about the tweet itself, but about my relationship to it, which means that this exact tweet when two people look at it, uh, that's literally two different tweets. It becomes a new tweet every time it's looked at because, because uh, it's the fundamental way it is, uh, is that it stores information not just about, um, about itself, but about its relationship to the people looking at it. So really, social media uh, is inherently, deeply social medium. And I can also pin down this claim that the tweet is a nested dictionary more than it is like the, the visual impression of a tweet or the text of a tweet. I can defend that because, so this object here, this big thing right here, I pulled that from Twitter using the same code I, I showed you guys. Um, however, if I just typed duka duka duka, I type my curly bracket, and I just create a dictionary, and it just happens to have all of these keys and valid values, uh, and I just like do all the typing um, and I create a user and I put a nested dictionary in that and I create all the key values. If I manually type a nested dictionary with this exact structure, 
than that exact structure on my computer. No one's ever seen it. It's never been on Twitter. It'll never touch Twitter. But it is a tweet. Um, a tweet uh, is uh, this specific pattern of nested key value pairs. Uh, and that's the sense in which the fact that I can literally author a tweet um, totally isolated from the Twitter ecosystem uh, in nested dictionaries is the fundamental fact that makes um, uh, the nested dictionary representation of the tweet more authentically what it is than any more familiar representation you've encountered uh, in the past. That was a lot of stuff. We started just with this new type of collection, which at the beginning was kind of hard to tell from the old type of collection. It wasn't totally clear how dictionaries improve a whole bunch off of lists. But um, we built more and more complex stuff, and, and we got pretty quickly into representing kind of real information about the world in a structured way um, uh, until we were able to uh, look at a thing that's very much in, in the, the real internet world um, a, a tweet and show a correspondence between this seemingly like professional thing and this pretty elementary concept that we just got introduced to. So we, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, we learned what dictionaries are, how to build access and change them in a way that's analogous to, uh, to what we're already familiar with, with lists. Um, we learned how nested dictionaries are useful and how to work with them, this sort of fact of taking a pair of square brackets and putting another pair of square brackets right after that and after that. Uh, we learned how to loop through dictionaries, and, and we discovered a bunch of things that are represented um, using them. Uh, we learned all the sort of freebies we get um, in terms of weird internet acronyms that we suddenly understand for free just because we understand how to build and work with and think about nested dictionaries. Uh, so with that, um, that's the end of Lesson 7, and uh, thank you very much.